And today I want to talk about the power of pressure. Turn to the person next to you and say, you're under pressure. You're under pressure. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. My hope today is that if you're feeling a sense of pressure in your life, pressure in your marriage, pressure in your relationship, pressure in your job, pressure in your faith, that you're feeling some pressure, I, I hope today you will leave understanding that that pressure is not an obstacle to be avoided, but it is an opportunity to be received, and there is power in your pressure. Come on, somebody. I am ready to teach today. I don't care if you're asleep. I'm going to get loud and get crazy. I hope you're with me, all right? The power of pressure. Uh, but to, to sort of frame this, what I want to do today is I want to talk about, I want to talk about first the promise that, that if you're a follower of Jesus and have been in a church before for maybe more than a year, you've probably heard these promises. And I guarantee you that if you've been following Jesus for most of your life, you've heard it multiple times. And these two promises I'm going to read from scripture are two promises that every single Christian amens. And that every single Christian will amen these promises, they will love these promises, they will want these promises, but even though these promises are promises that Christians all around the world will amen, it is a promise or two promises that very few Christians will actually activate in their lives. We will amen it all day, we will want it all day, and yet very few will cross the line from amening the promise to actually activating the promise in your life. And you may be like, well, Travis, how do you possibly know? That, that most Christians around the world are not activating the promises that, that you're about to share. And it's actually really simple. Because if you were to activate these promises in your life, I guarantee you that nothing about your life would remain the same. If you actually lived out these promises in your life, your marriage would not be the same, your relationships would not be the same, how you see yourself would not be the same, the way you look at your work would not be the same. These are the sort of promises that when you actually embrace and activate them in your life, they should wreck your life in the best sort of way. It should be one of those moments where you can never go back to who you were. That's how powerful these promises are. And yet so many people will amen the promises that I'm about to read and yet they will go on in their life and remain the exact same. So what promises am I talking about? I'm talking about one in Ephesians chapter 1 and the other in John chapter 14. Let me read the first one in Ephesians chapter 1. This first promise that everyone amens, but very few activate. Because if you did, it would change your life. Verse 19, Paul, he writes this. He says, I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in the heavenly realm. So I need you to understand what Paul's saying here. He's speaking to a church in Ephesus. He's speaking to this new community of followers of Jesus. And he's saying, look, I pray that you will understand something. And it's interesting what he wants them to understand. He doesn't say, I pray that you will understand biblical Greek and biblical Hebrew. He doesn't say, I pray you will understand the book of Revelation, even though no one will ever understand the book of Revelation. He doesn't say, I pray you will understand doctrine. He says this, I pray you will understand that in Christ you have this power. And it's not just any power, but it's the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Paul says within each and every follower of Jesus is the power that raised Jesus from the dead. And I can only imagine that Paul would write such a thing and would pray such a thing because he had witnessed firsthand followers of Jesus who love Jesus, who are trying to follow Jesus, who maybe know the teachings of Jesus, and yet they still live their lives in weakness. That there are people in Christ who have resurrection power within them and yet continue to remain in weakness. But you need to understand something. Otherwise, you're going to think that Paul is just being some motivational speaker, trying to get a rise out of the crowd, just trying to motivate people. Paul isn't just trying to give this audience an inspirational poster to put on their wall. He's not just trying to give them some religious platitude that really is hollow when you get down to it. Rather, Paul is only saying what Jesus said first. So if you don't believe Paul, maybe you'll believe Jesus because he's the one who gave this extraordinary promise first. In John chapter 14, the second promise that every Christian amens, but very few believe it enough to activate it in their lives. And Jesus says this, Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Anyone, everyone say anyone. anyone, not just pastors, not just missionaries, 
not just people who went to seminary, not just people who know and have memorized the books of the Bible in order. No, Jesus says, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I'm going to be with the Father. Have you ever read that verse? Have you ever allowed that verse to read you? Because that's a really extraordinary thing for Jesus to say, isn't it? Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus healed the blind. Jesus raised the dead. Jesus raised himself from the dead. And this Jesus says, you will not only do the same works, which is already extraordinary enough, but Jesus goes a little bit further, actually a lot further, and he says, you will actually do greater works than I did because I am going to be with the Father. I mean, that would be like you hanging out with Da Vinci. And after you hang out with him, he's like, you're going to create greater works of art than I ever created. Or you hang out with Beethoven, and Beethoven's like, you know, you're going to compose even more compelling and powerful moving music than I ever did in my lifetime. Or Steve Jobs, you hang out with him, and he's like, you're going to innovate even more world-shaping technology than I did in my lifetime. I mean, that is somewhat similar to what Jesus is saying, but it still only scratches the surface of the magnitude of what Jesus is saying here. And chances are, if you're like me, anyone here, you're open to admitting that you're slightly cynical? Any, any cynics in the room? Anyone sitting next to a cynic that isn't admitting it, just give them a nudge and tell them to be honest in Jesus' name. So, so like, if you're anything like me and slightly cynical, you might even read this and think, ah, Jesus is just trying to encourage us. Jesus is just being really motivating. He doesn't possibly mean, and he couldn't possibly mean, what he's telling us here, that we will do not only the same works that Jesus did, but we will do greater works than Jesus did in our lifetime. And I guess the question that we have to ask ourselves, and I think this is actually a really important question when it comes to all of the teachings of Jesus, but in particular this one, if Jesus was truly God, then is it possible that Jesus ever just shared an opinion? Right? Like an opinion, there's room to be wrong. There's room for error if you're sharing an opinion. But if Jesus is who he claimed to be, and Jesus never claimed to be just a good guy, a prophet, or a good teacher, he claimed one thing, and it was an extraordinary thing, and that he was actually God with skin on. That he actually was the divine in the flesh in front of us. And so if Jesus was who he claimed to be, and is who we claim him to be, then is it possible that God with, the fle with flesh on could just share an opinion? Or is it only possible, if it in fact was God, that Jesus could never share his opinion? He could only share truth. He could only share truth. And if Jesus here is not sharing an opinion for us to ponder, but a truth for us to embrace... He's not just giving us a motivational speech. He's not just giving us an attaboy. He's not just trying to motivate us to uh, a next level sort of living, but he actually believes what he's telling us, and that is that we could do the same works, if not greater works, than even he did in his lifetime. And if Jesus believes what he says he believes about us, I guess the question we need to ask is, do we believe Jesus? And the question isn't, do you believe in Jesus? The question is, do you believe Jesus? Far too many of us measure our, our faith and our discipleship by whether or not we believe in Jesus. But I'll tell you this, that the difference between where you are and where you were always created to be is not found in do you believe in Jesus, it's do you believe Jesus? Do you actually believe what Jesus says about you? Do you see, for your, do you see in yourself what Jesus apparently has always seen in you? I mean, that question should cause us to pause. I've been thinking about that question all week. Do I see in myself what Jesus apparently sees in me? And let me take that question a little bit further. The question after the question would be, what about your life would change right now? What about your life would change in the next year? If you began to live and build a life where you lived a life seeing in yourself what Jesus has always seen in you. See, I think true discipleship is less about understanding God and far more about believing God. And I think a lot of us, we've turned discipleship into this informational journey, which is very frustrating, by the way. Trying to understand God, super frustrating way to grow in your relationship with God. 
Because eventually at some point you're going to have to accept you can't understand God. And if you can't understand God, you probably have a God who's no greater, no bigger than you. And is that really a God worthy of their, your life? And so discipleship isn't about memorizing information. It's not an informational journey. It's a transformational journey. And I would argue that discipleship is less about what you know and more about what you believe, especially what you believe about what God believes about you. That discipleship in many ways, I think a foundational, fundamental part of discipleship is you aligning your beliefs, especially beliefs about yourself, with the beliefs that God has always had about you. Are you tracking? And so Jesus here, he says, there is immense power within you. And before we go any further, I think it's, it's worth our time to define what I mean by power. Because, man, we get power confused here in America, don't we? Like, like, we need to understand what words, what definitions we're working with when we use the word power. Because the power of God, this might be a shocker to some of you, is very different than the power of the West. The way God views power is different than how we view power in the United States. Power in the United States is about status. The power of God is about selflessness. The power of the West is about how much you have. The power of God is about how much you give. Power in the West is about the ability to crush your enemies. Power in God is the ability to forgive your enemies. Power in the West is all about the worship of self. Power in God is all about the worship of God. And so let's not get it twisted. The power of the West is different than the power of the kingdom of God. And when we get the power in the West confused as the power in the kingdom of God, we get ourselves in a lot of trouble in the church. If you don't know, need some examples of what that looks like, just look over the past few years where the church has confused what actual power is. And so when I talk about power within you, we got to make sure we're talking about the same thing. I'm talking about an immense and immeasurable power within you to live a life of sacrificial love. I'm talking about a, an immense and immeasurable power within you to live out ridiculous generosity. I'm talking about a power that God wants to give you to live a life of scandalous and ridiculous grace. And a power that is immense and immeasurable is within you to live a life of humble worship. That God has empowered you to live in this sort of power. It is within you. And Jesus says, because of this power, you have the ability to do the same works, if not even greater works, than Jesus himself. So I guess the question we should all be asking then is, why doesn't everyone who wants that power experience it? Because if I did a poll right now, I'm like, who wants the power of God in their life? Everyone's raising their hand. Like, no one's going to be like, nah, not me, I'm good. Like, like, no one's going to do that. So if wanting it isn't enough, then why is it that so many people who want it don't experience it? What's getting in between us, stepping into the power that Jesus believes and Paul prayed we were created to experience? And here's my guess. That although everyone wants the power of the promise I'm talking about, most people do not step into the power of the promise that Paul prayed for and Jesus talked about because they're not willing to go through pressure. That you don't get the power of the promise of God without experiencing some pressure in your life. It's like everyone wants to experience a miracle in their life, but no one wants to struggle. So how does that work? Everyone wants to have a dynamic faith in their life, but everyone wants to be in control of their life. And the same goes for the power of God in our life. Everyone wants the power, but why don't, doesn't everyone experience the power? Because very few people are willing to endure pressure. Everyone wants to do good work with their lives. But before you can do good work in your life, you got to move beyond the pressure to stay in a job that might help you make a living, but it will never empower you to make a life. You've got to move beyond that pressure to put in your two weeks, to take a step into the unknown, to look a little crazy from the outside looking in. You're going to have to face some pressure if you're going to do work that matters and leaves the world better than how they found it. But pressure, man, that's what stops most people. And it keeps people in a job they hate, stopping them from living a life they love. You know, everyone wants to be healed and whole from their past wounds. But what stops so many from stepping into that full healing and, and that full identity that God has for them is that they stop when they experience some pressure to be vulnerable. 
that they stop because they feel the pressure that if they're going to be healed and whole, they're going to have to allow themselves to be seen. But you can't be healed if you're not even willing to reveal what's actually going on in your heart. And so a lot of people, they want to be healed and whole, but they stop when they face the pressure of being seen and being vulnerable by others around them. Or maybe you take a stand in your family because there's some brokenness in your family. There's, there's a pattern of sin, a pattern of brokenness, a pattern of idolatry, a pattern maybe of a, a addiction or a pattern of abuse. And you see this getting passed down from generation to generation. And of course you want to break that pattern. But why doesn't everyone break the broken patterns in their family? Because in order to do so, they're going to have to face the pressure of having some tough converse- conversations and challenging the status quo that others have accepted before them. You see, if you want to experience the power of God in your life, I have some bad news for you. You will not experience the power of God in your life without facing a great deal of pressure. I mean, let me give you a visual here. Let's just say for some of you, you are this $3 yellow Amazon squirt gun. And and don't get me wrong, you're so much more valuable than that. But let's just imagine for a second that that this is you. Now, for, for some of you, you can relate to this like Like you were filled with ambition, you were filled with excitement, filled with dreams, filled with goals. Maybe going into 2021, man, you were like overflowing with all those things. And maybe even now in 2022, you are overflowing with like all the dreams and ambition that one could hope for. And can anyone relate to, maybe in 2021, maybe you're already feeling it in 2022, that even though you were full of all these hopes and dreams and goals and ambition, it's like, this is all that comes out of your life. Like, that's it. You're like, this is going to be a great year, new year, new me. I'm going to conquer every mountain. Squirt. Right? And you, you, you feel like you had so much going on in you, but very little is coming out. Maybe for some of you, are like, this is the year. I'm going to do work that matters. I'm going to do work that changes the world. I'm going to step out of a job I hate to build a life I love. And then by June, squirt. Like, the, you, you're like, my marriage is not very strong, my, but this is the year. This is the time. My, my wife and my, or my husband, we're going to learn how to communicate. We're going to be better parents. We're going to be better to one another. We're, we're, we're going to fight for with one another, not with one another all the time. And then it's like, squirt, just a few months later. Maybe for some of you, you're saying, this is going to be the year I take my faith to the next level. I'm going to pray more. I'm going to read the scriptures more. I'm going to have an intimate, dynamic relationship with God. Man, you bought the devotional. You started journaling the first week of January. By the second week, you already lost the journal. And then, and you had, you were full of so much, but like, that's all that came out. Come on. Can anybody relate to what I'm talking about right now? Like full of so much. And yet it feels like When push comes to shove, there's really just not a whole lot to show for it in your life. But then have you met the person? Maybe you feel like this person, but have you ever met the person that looks a little bit more like this? Like they're not the $3, they're not the $3 Amazon squirt gun. You know what I'm talking about? You look at them and they're the person that just seems to have everything going right in their life. Aren't those people annoying? Can I get an amen? Amen. Right? So you're like, I'm going to get a raise. And then they're like, I just became the CEO. I'm going to have a great marriage. We're going to go to the next level. And then you turn on Instagram and you see a couple renewing their vows on a beach. And uh, they've only been married two years. And they're so, they're so in love. And life just seems to be so perfect. Or you're like, this is the year. I'm going to grow in my relationship with God. And it's going to be amazing. And then it feels like God doesn't hear any prayer you pray. And you read the Bible and you're more confused after reading the Bible than you were before you read the Bible. And it seems like everyone else gets it. And you got people who have like God on speed dial for some reason, while you just can't seem to get God to respond. Come on, does anyone feel like this and compare themselves to people who look like this? You see, it's easy to look even at these two different squirt guns and be like, well, obviously, you know, this gun's going to be more powerful. You know, you're like, this is just a tiny, cheap, plastic squirt gun. I mean, this is a Fortnite limited edition Amazon squirt gun. I mean, goodness, it's bigger. The plastic is is tougher. It can hold more water. I mean, it's obviously, just look at it. It's just different. So, of course, it's going to produce greater results. You see, the difference, though, between these two things that make this gun more powerful than this 
is not that it's bigger. It's not that it's made of better plastic. It, it, it's not that it's colorful or Fortnite limited edition. And you're like, well, I, no. The only reason this gun is more powerful than that one is this one was built for pressure. Who hasn't been baptized yet? Let me know. <laughs> we'll take care of you right now. Baptism COVID edition, all right? Social distance, everything, all right. Like, the only difference, ultimately, is this one was built for pressure. And that pressure equips this with more power. Are you tracking? So there's some of you that you excuse yourself from the power that God has for your life because you're like, well, I guess I'm just not like them. I'm just not cut from the same cloth that they're cut from. I don't have the same family that they have. I didn't come from the same socioeconomic class that they came in. I didn't have the opportunities that they have. They are just different. This is all I am. This is all I'm going to be. Friend, I want to tell you that is a lie from the pit of hell that each and every person you were created with the capacity to carry the power of God that will do even greater things than Jesus saw in his lifetime. And I hope today you begin to believe what Jesus has always believed about you. But what's the difference? Gosh, it's not, it's not you being a different person. It's, it's you being willing to face some pressure. Because when you learn to face some pressure, you can go further. Eric. <laughs> you can go further. You can go faster. You experience a power that you never knew was possible. And the only difference is not that you became a new person, but that you began to embrace pressure in their life in your life. So there's people, right? They're like, man, I want to do work that I love. I don't want to do work that I hate. I want to do work that actually leaves the world better than how I found it. Man, the difference between you who do that and those who don't is basically found in your willingness to experience and face some pressure. Are you willing to face the pressure of turning in your two weeks? Are you willing to face the pressure of people on the outside who've probably settled for their own existence to try and keep you in yours and give you a hard time when you try and pursue a dream that's bigger than yourself? Come on. Like, like are you willing to face some pressure? Because if you're going to step into the power that God has for your life, you're going to need some pressure. You're going to need some pressure in your marriage. Man, so there's people who are like, I want to go to the next level in my relationship with God, and that's all good and great. You can read the books. You can follow the influencers on Instagram, but can I tell you something? You will never go into that next level in your relationship with God or in your, I'm sorry, your relationship with your spouse if you're not willing to face some pressure, you know, like the pressure of getting therapy when you need it. Can we get real right now? Like the number of couples that I meet and their marriage is falling apart, they can't communicate, they're always at each other's throat, they never seem to be on the same page, and I'll usually say, have you considered counseling? And the number of people in response after telling me how broken their marriage is, like, no, 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 we don't need counseling. And it is usually, spoiler alert, the husband. And the husband's like, I don't need counseling, I'm a man, I got chest air, I drink beer, I watch sports, I don't do counseling because that makes me weak. No, 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 it makes you strong if you're willing to get counseling. It makes you weak when you admit that when you don't think you don't need any. And you see these couples, what's amazing is they're not willing to face the pressure of admitting they're not okay. They're not willing to face the pressure of going to get some therapy. They're not willing to face the pressure to say, hey, we got some work to do. And so it's no coincidence that couples that aren't willing to face pressure together often don't stay together. But couples who are willing to face some pressure together, they go deeper together. They're closer with one another. They experience an intimacy in their relationship that they had always longed for, but they had to go through some pressure to get there. Or people who are wanting to grow in their relationship with God. You're like, man, I, I want to grow my relationship with God. This is going to be the year. I'm going to have an intimate, dynamic relationship with God. And you re buy the devotional. You, 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 you get a new Bible. I can't tell you every New Year's I see people with new Bibles. Like, like this is it. I got a new Bible. Now my heart has changed. Um, and, and, and they do all these things. And there's nothing wrong with that. I have no problem with people doing 21 days of whatever or reading your Bible or getting a new Bible. I have no problem with any of that. But have you noticed, I don't know if it's just me, but when I talk to someone who has a really deep, rich, meaningful relationship with God, and I go, how did you get that deep, meaningful, rich relationship with God? They don't go, well, you know, I just read a devotional. I just read a devotional, and bam, I got it. Or, you know, I just, I just went to church every Sunday. I sat in a seat, sang the songs. 
prayed the preacher didn't squirt me with a squirt gun, like, and, 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 and my whole life changed. No, 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 no. If you actually ask somebody who has a deep relationship with God, you ask them, how did you get there? They're going to tell you battles they faced. You, you talk to somebody who has a deep, dynamic relationship with God, they're not going to tell you that they read something. They're going to tell you they went through something. They went through something, and they experienced God in the midst of that storm. They came to the end of themselves, and they realized what God's power was actually able to do. You see, some of you, let's just go there. You've not experienced a powerful relationship with God because you're still living a life that you don't even need God's help to live. Can we get real? Like some of you, actually, you could pursue the dreams, ambitions, and work that you're doing with your life, and you don't even need God's intervention to accomplish the goals you have. And then you're like, why don't I experience the power of God in my life? Because you're not willing to face some pressure. You're not willing. Don't walk in that area after service. You're not, you're not willing to put yourself in a position where you experience some pressure in your life. Are you tracking? Let me hear you right now. Are you tracking with me? Like, pressure is not an obstacle to be avoided. It's an opportunity to be received. Why? Because you are better under pressure. You're better under pressure. Look to the person next to you and say, you're better under pressure. You're better under pressure. I, I, I think of these quotes. I want to read a few quotes. First one from Helen Keller. Helen Keller said this. She said, character cannot be developed in ease and quiet. Only through experience of trial and suffering can the soul be strengthened, ambitioned, inspired, and success achieved. Come on. Or I think about what Greek writer and historian Herodotus, he said this, adversity has the effect of drawing out strength and qualities of a person that would have laid dormant in its absence. You realize the power that has already been within you when you go through some pain. Man, some of you are realizing the power that was within you because you didn't know how you were going to make it through a year like 2020 and a year like 2021, but guess what? You're still here. That God got you through it. That there is a power that you could not have experienced or known within you if you did not experience the weight of pressure in your life. I think about what French philosopher Albert Camus said. He said this, in the depth of winter, I finally learned that within me there lay an invincible summer. It's beautiful, isn't it? Like in the depth of winter, and some of you feel right now maybe in the depth of winter. Maybe you're watching online and you're in the depth of winter. But it is in those winter seasons, those winter moments, those moments where you come to the end of yourself that God's power begins to start to move in and through you in a way that you never knew was possible. You are better under pressure. Some of you, you're feeling pressure and you need to write this down on your mirror, put it on your refrigerator, tattoo it to your arm. Arm. You need to do whatever you need to do to remember this. You are better under pressure because if you want to experience the power of God in your life, you're going to experience pressure in your life. And so you can either play offense or defense with your pressure. I'm going to choose to play offense. How about you? Instead of making my pressure or allowing my pressure to be something that causes me to run from God, I'm going to have my pressure be a catalyst that compels me to run to God. And God seems to know this about people. God seems to know that pressure makes all of us stronger because there is not one single story in the scriptures. If you find it, you can tell me after service. But I have yet to find one in the scriptures of a person who stepped into the powerful movement of God in their life and did so without pressure. That they just kind of like walked into it like, oh, I guess this is it. There's not one story I can find where a person stepped into the power and promise of God without facing some pressure. Abraham, he faced the pressure of being the first iconoclast and leaving all he knew to step into the promise. Before David would kill Goliath, he would have to feel the pressure of the potential of letting an entire nation down. Esther put her life on the line to stand against people who were being crushed by an oppressive system. Before Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego would witness the greatest miracle and the greatest intervention in their lifetime, they would have to feel the pressure of refusing to bow to that which is incompatible with their convictions and with who God is. And they went through the fire. But it was in the fire that they experienced 
a power of God that they'd never known was possible. And Jesus would feel the weight and pressure of not only the cross he carried and the people he carried the cross for, but he would feel all that pressure before he would ever rise again. You see, before we had a resurrection on Sunday, we had a crucifixion on Friday. And so many of us, we want to skip Friday and just get straight to Sunday. But if you skip Friday, you don't get to Sunday. If you try and live a life without pressure and pursue promise and power without pressure, then you'll never step into the fullness of what it is that God wants to do in and through your life. If you want God's promises, I'm just warning you, you're going to have to be ready to face great pressure. And so I want to give you a statement that maybe you can say to yourself, you can remind yourself in times of great pressure. Let me say it right now. It's not going to be on the screen, but I want you to hear it, maybe write it down, but get it in your spirit. It's this. Your pressure is not a problem to be resolved. Some of you have been like, man, how do I get rid of this pressure? How do I just get through this pressure? How do we get this away from me? Your pressure is not a problem to be resolved. No, no, no. Change the perspective. Your pressure is a promise to be received. Your pressure is not a problem to be resolved. Your pressure underneath that pressure is a promise to be received in your life. Today, I want to encourage those that you're here and you feel under pressure, under pressure in your job, under pressure in your marriage, under pressure in your relationships, under pressure with your identity, under pressure with your future. What I hope to do is not resolve your pressure, not just take it away, but rather I would want to hopefully bring a teaching today that your perspective would shift to see that there is a promise underneath the pressure and that you actually are better under pressure. And what is the promise underneath the pressure we face? The promise is the same one that Paul prayed for, that you have resurrection power in your life and that you have the same power that was pumping in the veins of Jesus in your veins as well. My friend, you're better under pressure. Let's see what God wants to do. Let's not quit before the breakthrough. Let's come to the end of ourselves and see God's power truly begin to move in our lives.